Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. We are going through Bhagavad Gita. We are on chapter 11. We are going to start with 15 and go through 20 first. So I will read out in English. Then Yogeshwar is going to read in, you know, read it out in Sanskrit and talk about his, um, you know, his thoughts on each of the verses. And then we are going to open it up for any questions or comments. And then we'll go to the next section. Let's get started. This is verse 15 of chapter 11. I'm reading from the Sri Aurobindo translation. Arjun said, I see all the gods in thy body, O God, and different companies of beings. Brahma, the creating Lord seated in the lotus and the rishis and the race of divine serpents. I see, the num I see numberless arms, bellies, eyes, and faces. I see thy infinite forms on every side, but I see not thy end, nor thy middle, nor thy beginning, O Lord of universe, O form universal. I see thee crowned and with thy mace and thy discus, hard to discern because thou art a luminous mass of energy on all sides of me, an encompassing blaze, a sun bright, fire bright, immeasurable. Thou art the supreme, immutable, whom we have to know. Thou art the high foundation and abode of the universe. Thou art the imperishable guardian of the eternal laws. Thou art the sempiternal soul of existence. I behold thee without end or middle or beginning of infinite force, of numberless arms. Thy eyes are suns and moons. Thou hast a face of blazing fire, and thou art ever burning up the whole universe with the flame of thy energy. The whole space between earth and heaven is occupied by thee alone. When is seen this thy fierce and astounding form? The three worlds are all in pain and suffer. O thou mighty spirit. Yogeshwar. Arjuna Uvacha. Pashyami Devans Tava Deva Dehe. Sarvans Tatha Bhuta Vishesha Sangan. Brahmana Misham Kamala Sanastham. Rishins Cha Sarvan Uragans Cha Divyan. So in verse 14, we saw that Tata Savismaya Vishtu, Rishta Roma Dhananjaya. How did Arjun react to this? As Sanjay was elaborating to Dhritarashtra. Now, he has seen all this, according to Sanjay's explanation. And Arjuna now, Vishmaya, Vismaya Vishtu, he is like, completely taken out by what he has seen. Rishta Roma, all his hairs is just standing up. Like he can't really, what is in front of him is so great. It's so grand an event that everything is happening in his body. What does he do? Pranamya Shirasa Devam Kritan Jali Rabhashata. He, one thing is Kritan Jali. He has folded his hands together. And he is with his head bowing down. And who is he bowing down to? Devam. He is bowing down to what? 
he is seeing in front of him, the experience he's having in front of him, it is so grand that in a way, here how it is written, it's like the, our first interpretation would be that he bowed down, but then also look at another way of looking at it, that the event in front of him was so great that he couldn't resist buying down. He just, his body just bowed down. It was an automatic thing. And in that way, for example, we can't, um, we can't really, you know, make our hair stand up like Rishta Roma. We can't do that, but it happens. So even the, so everything here in this verse, in verse 14, everything that is written here is an automatic process. It happens when such a grand event is in front of you, including Rishta Roma, Vismaya Vishta, all those events, whether your hairs are standing up, you're having that um, in your, that chill in your spine, all that. It is part of a grand event happening in front of you. And even the bowing down, the folding of the hands, it is also such an automatic event. It is not that Arjuna did it, but something that happened to Arjuna. Now in verse 15 here, what Arjuna is saying now, how Arjuna is experiencing it. One thing to note is the experience is so grand that words will fall short, always. Words will never be able to capture the whole experience as it is. Logical words will fall even more short than that because they won't be able to capture what has actually happened. This is past logic. It's past our minds. What Arjuna now is doing is revealing his own experience using metaphors, using how we would understand it, how we would experience it. What if something like this happened the experience that we would have is the same experience Arjuna was having at that time. So, in a way here, Arjuna is saying that Pashyami Devan Stava Deva Dehe. In Indian culture, you see all the Devas in the Supreme, in the Ultimate. First thing, like when you're climbing the steps, the first thing that will come is you see the Supreme in the Devas. You're looking for the Supreme because as we have discussed before, what Deva means is something that you can see the Supreme in. Something that, that can take you from the state you are in upwards towards the Supreme, towards the ultimate. And now, what Arjun was asking in verse in chapter 10 was how can I see the Supreme in something that I'm seeing right here? So Krishna said that look in Devas, look in Adityas, look in Rudras. And now what Arjuna is saying is, I have found you. I have found the ultimate in the Devas. Now there is something else happening as well not just finding the Supreme in the Devas, but the Devas are now one with the Supreme. They've all become one. They're all now in one place where the Supreme resides. That is what Arjuna is trying to say here by saying, Pashyami Devan Stava Deva Dehe. I am seeing all all that you've told me in chapter 10, I'm seeing everything in you. All the experiences that I've had while you've 
told me, chapter 10, every experience, I'm having it right now, at once, no experience left out. And I'm seeing everything in you. Sarvans tatha bhuta vishesha sangan. Not only the devas or the material things that you said that you reside in, in chapter 10. But Arjuna is going ahead. Sarvans tatha bhuta vishesha sangan. Not only the material things that point towards the ultimate, not only that, but everything at the peripheral, all the forms are pointing to the function. Here, Arjuna is, is saying that. Not only that which you are shown in most, not only the flower, but even the thorn, is Brahma. Arjuna wants to point out that. Brahma Namisham Kamala Sanastham Rishinscha Sarvan Uragansha Divyan. Now I will say them one by one. So we start with the greatest Brahma, meaning the force of creation, where all creation starts. And that I can see is inside you. And then from the start of the creation goes direct to the end of the creation, Isham. And I'm very well aware that Isham is sometimes translated to Brahma as well, directly. But in Amar Kosha, Isham is a name of Shiva, Shankar. So how I am translating this is taking it from the, right from the beginning towards the end directly. Like I see you in Brahma, I see you in Shiva. I see you in the force of creation, I see you in the force of destruction. And that is a grand event. Like in our logical terms, we would only want to put the ultimate where we see love, where we see creation happening, where we see something good happening, according to our eyes. Because according to us, destruction or death is not that good. Arjuna has totally changed from the within. He's experiencing this. I'm seeing you in the force of creation. I'm seeing you in the force of destruction as well. Kamala Sanastham Rishins Chasarvan. So all those. So Kamala Sanastham, how I am translating it, because I'm well aware of different translations of this verse. So how I'm translating this Kamala Sanastham is we all know Padmasan, which you fold your feet in a, in a way that they look like a lotus, the lotus uh, position in yoga. So those who are seated in the lotus position, who are practicing to become a rushi, those who are practicing to get to the ultimate, I can see you in there. And rushins chasarvan, yeah? even those who have reached you, I can see you at the start, like first start and end was of the creation. Now the start here is those who are starting their journey towards the ultimate. Kamalasanas. And then he goes to the end. Rishins, Chasarvan. All those who have reached you, who have gotten to their flowering, who have gotten to the ultimate there, I can see you in there. And one thing to note here as well is how Indian culture takes death or how Indian culture takes destruction. In a way, old age would mean coming towards death, getting towards your death. There is one thing in Indian culture that we revere, we worship those who are old age. We bow down to those who are of old age. Here, not only 
for material experience, not only for the experience in the world, but another thing is if you see life. Now, life has one thing, which is creation, which is our birth. And life has another aspect, which is destruction, which is our death. Within all that, what we normally think is the flowering of life happens when we are in the youth. That is the flowering we see. Because our perspective of life is only life as we are living it right now. But the Indian perspective of life is viewing both of them together, birth and death together. In that way, if you see birth and death together, birth is the start and death is Purnata. Now what Purnata means is one translation is getting to the end, but another translation in Hindi as well, Purnata means you've come to the flowering of your life. You've come to that stage whereby you're the fullest you can be. So at that time, we bow down to the old. Yeah. Do you want to say something, Shripa? I think completion. Yeah. That, like, full, yeah. full completion. But now you see, Purnata, completion, would, we would normally think of completion as, oh, yes, it is completed, at least, at last. But here, completion is like getting to the fullest, like becoming your fullest. So that's the difference here, is you can see the Brahma within the start and the end. And that is really revert here. And then Uragans Chadivyan. Not only that, like I, not only those good, great things, but Uragans Chadivyan. Yeah? There are these divya, these divine serpents that I can see. Now to call a serpent divine, we normally are scared of a serpent. We're normally so scared that in any metaphor or any story that we're telling children, like those pebbles or anything, where would we would put a serpent or a snake would be somebody who is cunning or somebody who like tells you the wrong way to go in all those, even in Panch, Panch Tantra, which is a fable stories in India. It is a collection of many fable stories from India. In there even, all those roles for the cunning and those who show you the wrong way, all that is given to the serpent or to the fox. Such um, individuals. So in a way here, the way Arjuna is able to say, Uragans Chadivya. I also see you there. It is life changing. It is like his view of life, his view of the ultimate has changed. Not only that, his view of the material world has also changed completely. He's not seeing it the same way he was seeing it at the start of Gita. Totally different here. Aneka bahu dharavaktra netram pashyami tvam sarvato nantarupam nantam namadhyam napunastavadim pashyami vishveshwara vishwarupa Aneka bahu dharavaktra netram one thing that is normally shown in Mahabharata, if like I've also not seen it, but I've heard because there was a series Mahabharata, which was um, played out on TV, like long back when, when I was a kid. And that time I watched it, but not with that much interest. Normally you just, you know, and there how it would be shown. It was like, oh, he has many mouths, many faces, many eyes now i realize that 
may it not be physical. Krishna is just Krishna as he is. Huh? He is just in his human form as he is. The experience of Arjuna is what is being described here. Aneka bahu dara vaktra netra. Aneka bahu, meaning so many hands. Aneka udara, meaning so many stomachs, like so many abdomens, like we shall say. Vaktra netram. So many eyes, like so many faces of himself. Pashyami tuam sarvato nanta rupam. I can see you everywhere. If I see right, left, behind, in front of me, that is not possible with any normal person. Ananta rupam, meaning not in one form only. Rupam meaning form. Not only in one form am I seeing you now. Because at first he was only saying Krishna as he is in front of him, explaining all these things to him, explaining the whole of Gita to him. Now Arjuna is saying, Ananta Rupa, in so many forms I can see you. And one thing to note here in Aneka Bahu Daravakta Netra, it is like how I am seeing somebody I love. And then I'm saying that, oh, it's like I've never seen you before. Not literally true, but the experience I'm having, it can only be explained by that sentence. Nothing else. Because that's the experience I'm, I am having, that it's like I've never seen you before. So... The only words that can capture the experience that Arjuna's had is Aneka Bahu Daravaktra Netra. But not only literally, like not as we would like to think it, but something like an experience that I have had. It's not that that person has come in front of me for the first time ever. But when you fall in love, that emotion, it compels you to have that experience that this is the first time you're seeing that person and you'll have completely different eyes for seeing that person. It's like your whole self has changed. You're never the same person again. That's how Arjuna is seeing Krishna. Different realm here. Nantam namadhyam napunastavadim Pashyami Vishweshwara Vishwarupa. I cannot see your end. Now, here Arjuna starts with the end, not with the start. Arjuna is starting with the end. I cannot see your end. I cannot see your middle. Napunastavadim. Now, he would have just said, I cannot see your start, but here, Arjuna is saying, also, I cannot see your start. Like, there's so many things. Yeah? We would like to, we would want to be able to think about that everything in this world would, must have a start, a middle, and an end. The middle meaning the time it is. So there is birth, and then there is life. And then there's death. So the life is the middle. Everything between birth and death. We would like to put everything into that criteria. Everything that we see around us fits that criteria. 100%. There is a start, there is a middle, and there is an end. But Arjuna here is saying that this is the first time I've realized something. I cannot see your start. I cannot see your end. Now, that's also fine. I cannot see your start and your end. But I cannot also see you being here right now. Like, I cannot see you here. It's like I can't see your middle. I can't see your life. That's 
at least if I can see, if I can say I'm seeing Krishna, I should be able to say, maybe I've not seen your birth. I won't be able to see your death. Maybe you're so large. I can't see both, but at least I can see your life. You're right now in front of me. Arjuna is saying here, no, I can't see that. I can't see you here. I'm seeing you everywhere. That's why he continues that Pashyami Vishweshwara Vishwarupa. One sentence leads to the other. They're not one sentence and then the other. It's not differentiated, but it is the first sentence leading to the other. Because I cannot see you here, like I can't specify you, that this is you, this is your life, between your birth and your death. I am seeing you as Vishweshwara, Vishwa Ishwara. You're at the topmost, you're the ultimate. Ishwara meaning ultimate, like topmost. Of Vishwa meaning everything, everything that I'm seeing. And then Vishwa Rupa. One thing to note here is Vishwa Rupa is the name of this chapter. Vishwa Rupa Darshana Yoga. So one thing to note here is um, Vishwa Rupa, meaning that form that is in the, in the form of Vishwa. It is in the form of everything. There's nothing that is void of Krishna. There's nothing that is void of the ultimate. The first time when I was young, I came across Vish the name Vishwa Rupa. I would normally in my mind, what I would think is Vishwa Rupa, meaning that, oh, he has, he has like now taken out so many forms or he has become so big, he himself, his physical form. But now I realize that Vishwa Rupa would mean Krishna is there, but now what Krishna is saying, I am, like not the body of Krishna, but what Krishna is saying, I am, Arjuna has realized it. And Arjuna is saying that you are Vishwarupa. You are in each and every form. Even though he is pointing out to Krishna, but the experience he's, he is having is totally different. Like it's, I can see you everywhere in each and everything, in the horses that are in front, even on the seat I am sitting, even on the chariot that we are both on, everywhere I can see you. Even in the army that is in front of us or the army that is behind us, both of them, I can see you, Vishwa Rupa, meaning that you can see the ultimate within each and everything. And when that happens, then we'll have the experience as Arjuna's had it in chapter 11. So uh, I'll have to leave at this point in time. So right. Shrikan, we'll take it Thank on. You. Thank you, Yogeshwar. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, folks. So um, now I'm going to open it up for any comments on, uh, on what you have heard so far. This chapter is very interesting. Okay, the really unique thing about this chapter is that it is showing you what it is actually, the, it's called Vish, you know, Vishwarup Darshan. So it is actually showing you Krishna in everything. It is the God in everything. Obviously, it's very difficult to capture it in words. So what Arjun is doing is that he's saying, there are so many eyes. There are so many faces. Everywhere I look, it is you. Everything I see is you. So there are various ways in which he's trying to capture the eternal in each and everything. And that's what the beauty of this chapter is. So I'm going to open it up for comments, 
and questions. Uh, today, uh, Yogeshwar had to leave early, so we are going to discuss this part and then feel free to bring up anything on Gita that we have discussed. Okay, um, Evanik. Yeah, I think uh, when Yogeshwar was talking about um, birth and death being the same, like being a part of the same cycle, I guess. Um, and that, you know, death is the meanings that you've lived your life to the fullest, right? And I was thinking of that and I was thinking, well, you know, some people haven't lived their life to the fullest. So it just stresses the importance of living your life. And living a life that brings you closer to who you are. Because when you come to that moment, you know, you can feel like you've, you're complete and you can be at peace. And Rupali, a couple of weeks back, I remember, I think she was telling the story of her mother-in-law. And it was very beautiful the way she told it. And it seemed like it was a very peaceful. And even though it was sad because she was losing her loved one, obviously, that it was just a very fulfilling experience. And I was thinking of that when you guess what was talking about living your life to the fullest. And that's the point, right? You know, that way you can come to the end of your life and be proud overall of who you were or who you are in that moment and then go into the next cycle or the next stage in your life if you believe in an afterlife. So, um, so yeah, so it's just, that's what it brought up for me. Excellent. Um, so the way I understand it, there are a couple of points which are unique about the Indian way of thinking. And I encourage everybody to talk today about how they see this Gita way of looking at life looking at ourselves different from what we are used to. So for example, in this case of beginning, middle and end, you can see that the Indian mind makes peace with the beginning, the middle and the end. They are considered gods. You know, there is Brahma, Vishnu and Mahesh. They're considered natural. They're considered to be part of Brahma. So it is part of nature. And so he sees, on one hand, he sees the, the God in the beginning, middle, and end. The, on the other hand, he's saying, I don't see your beginning, middle, and end. That's another way of saying is that you're eternal. You're eternal. It, you, you run through everything. You, there are cycles, but you are you remain yourself throughout the cycle. So it's kind of, it's both those points. Uh, thank you. Next up is Alison, followed by Joe. Alison. Um, I was really struck by um, the verse when he was talking about um, seeing God when you're in, um, in the lotus position, or, you know, he said sitting on your lotus throne. And um, I thought it's just so interesting because I always felt like, um, so many years ago, my, my aunt was very, very um, religious and she was Catholic, never missed a service ever. And she said, um, you know, how do you, you know, like how on earth do you live without having church? You know, what is your church? What do you do? And I remember, I, and I, I just said, dance, dance is my church. And, um, but I remember she's like, that's not church. That's not religion. And I said, well, I, it, it kind of feels like it is. And she just completely dismissed it. And then years later, I, you know, and I started yoga. Um, I always do yoga on Sunday mornings. Um, and then like another time of the week. But I, again, I felt like the same thing in yoga that it felt like, like a, like my version of church in a way that it was, there's something about it was very spiritual. Uh, but I just thought that was, I was like, well, maybe it's the endorphins or, you know, I was like trying to rationalize it, but it's so funny to, to read in here that, you know, that right here in this, they're saying that it, you, you do see it in the body. 
Um, so it just kind of makes me feel like I was right all along, you know, or that I'm not the only one that feels this. And it's, it's just something comforting to know that so many years ago, this was written and that people then felt the same, same thing that I felt. Um, no, I, absolutely. It's, it's actually a profound point. Um, it's a point which I find to be true, both with the Bible and with Bhagavad Gita. The terminology is different, but the point is the same. The way in which Bhagavad Gita expresses it is that you have Atma within you. You have your soul within you. And the idea is Tattvamasi. Your soul is a piece of Brahma, of the eternal universal principle. So when you are focused on the core of your being, whether while doing meditation, yoga, or in doing an activity like dance, where the entire of your being is engaged in it, and you are speaking from the core of you, that is the heart of religious experience. When yeah. Jesus is talking about the religious experience, he's talking about having living water, a fountain of living water in your heart that is overflowing, which is your love of God, your love of truth, your love of goodness, your love of beauty, and you're acting in accordance with that. And that is what being religious is. Things like temples and church are social ways of implementing it. When done right, they are profoundly beautiful and they help people connect to the real church, which is within you. But all too often, they get lost in forms. So I, it, I mean, the, the, the principle is that they are meant, the original idea of church, as we saw in John 4, is that community of a community of people who are feeling like that in their heart, therefore can interact with one another like that, so can help each other do that all the time. That's the idea of the church, not the building, not anything else, just that. And it is a way of amplifying this God in you. Because there is God in each of us, a community which is doing that is a church or is a divine community, if you will. So that's what is being said. So you are absolutely right. And Bhagavad Gita agrees with you. And I think the, the Bible also agrees with you. Um, now, at the same time, I don't want to put down, I'm not saying, I'm, I'm saying that the institutions as originally conceived are of tremendous value because it is a means for people to do that. But all too often people forget, you know, get forms mixed with function. So they say, oh, you don't have a form, so you don't have the function. And they don't realize that some people who have the form don't actually have the function. Some of them do. Uh, so I don't know whether that this makes sense to you. Alice. No, that's, it's beautifully put. And it, one thing that I've noticed also is that, I mean, I've been to, um, you know, I've been to many different kinds of churches and, and then I've also gone into um, temples like in China and Japan and it had a very, you know, different religions, but it always had that same kind of feeling, you know, there's, there's something like when they're burning the incense and, and, um, the, the music or the chanting. And, and I, I remember thinking like, it doesn't seem to matter what part of the globe you're on, what they're calling this, the experience is the same. And the experience is very, very similar to what you feel when you're dancing or when, you know, you're doing yoga or. Um... Exactly, beautifully put. So um, let, let's stay on this point for, for a minute because this is a core point here. 
um, my favorite place, religious place, is actually its golden temple, which is in Amritsar, which is of this Sikh. Uh, it's a cent, it's a temple of the Sikh religion. The way it is constructed itself. First thing is that like one of my friends, American friends, uh, who was visiting there, um, he said, this is very odd. It looks like as soon as people enter, 10 years drop off their face just by entering the place. And everybody kind of becomes more childlike just, just by being there. The way it is, is that it is open. It has gates on all four sides, which is saying, come. Doesn't matter who you are, come. You're all well, you're, you're welcome. So that's one. The second part of it is that in the center of it is this lake, artificial lake. So water produces a level of peacefulness. There is a golden temple, you know, which is covered with gold leaf, right in the middle of that lake. And there is one path to it. So what it is saying is that everybody is welcome. There is this peacefulness. There is the temple. There is a moral path to it. They are continuously singing 24 hours. They're singing the book that they have which is actually compilation, which is borrowed from every religion. Pieces of it is borrowed from every religion. The last guru that they had said that now from now on, that book is your guru. So you just read it and listen to it and follow your heart. That's what you do. So they sing it and it's all set, set to beautiful music, Indian classical music. And they have these food, they have these giant halls where people donate food, donate their time and their money, and they cook these giant like lentils in, uh, in these pots, which are the size of like 20 feet by 20 feet diameter. And it's all free. So anybody you go there, you just go and eat what if, you know, as much as you want. And uh, there are people who are really well off who take care of your shoes. So they do what is called seva, service. It doesn't matter who you are. People from every social strata will come and do that. But what I'm saying is that that feeling that is there, and no matter who you are, you will feel that. So there is a commonality. So the same thing that we are seeing in the texts that we are studying, Tao Te Ching, um, Bhagavad Gita, and the Gospel of John. Similarly, what the places of worship are trying to do is something similar. It is trying to, trying to produce an atmosphere which makes this building, you know, the temple within you possible. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much for the observations. Thank you. Next up is Joe. Hi, good evening. I was a little late. Uh, so um, I missed some of the commentary. Uh, but uh, I thought Avanique actually brought up a very important point. Um, and it's a point that I actually brought up uh, recently in a, in a separate meetup uh, altogether, actually. Uh, it was the beginning, middle, and end. And as my understanding is that is the unmanifested, manifested, and then unmanifested again. Is that, am I understanding that correctly? Um, it doesn't, I mean, the, the way in which it works in, um, in the Bhagavad Gita is different. Okay. Um, it is like, it is creation, sustenance, and death or transformation. So it is like um, it is it is like the seed germ. The seed germ is the beginning. The, okay. The flowering tree is the middle. It's full kind of living force, 
that is producing seeds. And then the death of the tree, the leaves falling off, the branches falling off, that is destruction. So it is very much similar to the cycles of life that, that you see. In terms of manifest and unmanifest, it is like the eternal principle, the, un, the con concept of manifest and unmanifest, which mm -hmm. is operational here throughout chapter 11, is that there is God. He's talking to Krishna. That is the universal principle. And its manifestations are everywhere. So right. it's saying that the unmanifested universal principle is manifested through everything. So that's where the manifest and unmanifest shows up in this chapter. So then that is the, that's the cosmic view that Arjuna is seeing. And, and is that, and, and that is called uh, Vish. Vishwa Ru. Vishwa Ru. Vishwa is the world. Rup is the form and Darshan is sight. So he is seeing okay. the form of the world. He's seeing that the eternal is being manifested in every form in the world. And he's okay. seeing it. That is the Darshan. So that's why this chapter is called that. That makes, I mean, now everything kind of comes together because then it, it starts to, it's building on what we've already known, right? Is that he's telling Arjun that we're in, I'm in everything, but now he's actually seeing it mm -hmm. um, and, and seeing it through, you know, all these uh, different forms. And it's almost like his senses are kind of overloaded. And uh, yes, so he's like kind of, and, and, it, and in a way, um, that kind of that, that's a very powerful concept is, is that once you start to look inwards, you know, that it does become overwhelming. Uh, it, it is something that is a, it's a spiritual, you know, experience with that. And if you get there, it, it starts to, if you think about seeing God and everyone around you and then everything, that's even, I mean, that's kind of still a little bit incomprehensible to me to a certain degree i see it in nature like real nature but seeing it in everything is very hard um but if you see it in every one that's where that's the beauty of the transformation that takes place and this is just another way of kind of articulating that and the idea and i and that so thank you for that translation because world form and sight and then the senses and what they're, he's taking in in that process um it, it's it's a uh it's a very powerful image and i one side comment it, it is interesting I, I to see the use of serpents um used uh it, it's because it's, it, it's in the bible it's such a, a different <laughs> way of looking at at serpents uh which i i, I just find that interesting i i don't yeah, not, yeah they, just a side comment whatever yeah, no, no, absolutely. So firstly, um, I want to, so let, let me take the side comment first. Um, so, uh, so folks, uh, just feel free to type exclamation mark if you want to talk about the general topic is not just, you can talk about this chapter, these verses, or you can talk about how you see, what are you learning, which is different in kind of the way you look at life, where you look at yourself, where you look at other people, how is the Indian mind, how is the Bhagavad Gita different, okay? Um, so the point about serpent is that the Indian philosophy embraces everything. He's say, saying that serpents are also part of life, are part of the universe, and it just embraces everything. So that's one thing. The second one, I want to, the, the way in which, for example, Naneshwar describes it in one of his poems, is that Paya Padu Geleta. So what he's doing is that he's trying, now there is God in front of him, okay? And he's saying, okay, now let me bow down to you. Let me touch your feet. He goes to look for the feet, but he couldn't, he can't see the feet. Then he starts to look at him and he can't figure out whether he's looking towards him or away from him. So what he's saying is that he's everywhere. He's pointed in every direction. He's in everything. If you 
try to zero in and say, okay, his feet are here. They're not there because they're everywhere. Uh, if I see, is he looking at me or is he not looking at me? No, he's looking at everywhere. <laughs> so it's, it's, a, it's a way of describing everything. And just as you said, it is, he's now bringing it to the senses. He's trying to, before in chapter 10, he was describing it in different kinds of entities. And you're saying, this, I'm the Himalaya of the mountains. I'm the top of what is, you know, what is possible. Um, here, what he's saying is that he's there in every sense. You know, universal principle is there in every sense. God is everywhere. That's what he's trying to say. And he's trying to describe step by step. Go ahead. And, and to me, so that that's what the Gita is the most powerful concept in, in, in the Gita for me, is that when you can start to see God in everything. And, and I actually, this is something in a very practical sense um, that I've applied that is actually, you know, kind of uh, supplemented my stoicism in, in the sense that in, reserve, in judgments, if it, it, you reserve judgment and if you start to see the God in everyone um, and, and it starts to, it becomes a practice, it's a, it's a practice, it's a practice, but, and you have to look inward first. I understand that it, that's a, that's, that's the only way you're ever, you're ever going to get there is if you find the God in yourself. But, um, and if it's such a powerful concept that you can try and use it mentally as well. So no, absolutely beautifully put. I mean, that, that, that is, that is a, I, I mean, I think for many people, including myself, that is the most powerful point of the idea of namaste. Right. Okay. Because it in one, one action, a single action of saying namaste, it encompasses so much. You are right. Like in order to say namaste, you have to first say the God in me. You have to be able to say God in me. If you cannot, if you have no connection to the God in you, the gesture is empty. Because if there is no God in, if you can't see the God in you, you can't greet the, see the God in other, there is no way you can see it. So right. you have to be able to see the God. But once you see the God in yourself, then what happens is that you, when you actually look at another person, you see the God in them. So you see that there is something in them, even though they don't see it. Okay, even when they don't see it, you see it. And what that does is that it is transformational, not just for you, but for them, it's like giving them visibility mm. on something that is precious within them that they have forgotten or they are not really paying attention to. But because you are paying attention to them, attention to that, they become a little bit more aware of it. And that is transformational. This is the same idea there are two different ways in which we have looked at it. There are two different thinkers that have used this idea very effectively in the Western corpus. One of them is Carl Rogers. His idea is that of authentic relating, which is also based on this. You know, he uses different terms. He says unconditional regard. But that's, again, the same thing. The root is the same. Other person who is much deeper than Carl Rogers is Martin Buber in the I Thou, where you're saying that the core of you is relating to the core of the other person instead of focusing on the transaction that you are doing. So instead of focusing on the it, which is what you are transacting, you're focusing on who you are. And the formulation of Gita on this, 
It's so simple, so beautiful, and so powerful. So thank you for bringing that up because I think yeah. I think that is one of the things that uh, I think many 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 people are taking taking. Uh, I, it, it's in it's a, it is transformational again not only for yourself but for the relationships and then the idea of how that enables it's more than self acceptance. That's it, it's you know everybody can accept somebody can accept themselves. That's just, that's kind of you know what we just do and in, in certain. But it's something deeper than that. It's it's again, you're finding the spiritual side that allows you to, as Louis Sullivan would say, break out. Yes. You know, that's the breaking out that then allows you to transform everybody else around you. And that is evident in people that that see that. That's it, it, when you're around somebody that has that ability to see the God in themselves. And, and bring it out from and remind everybody else around them. Um, I, I mean, I would argue, and to a certain degree, I, you know, you could almost see that through Yogeshwar. Yes. Uh, and, and so, um, yeah, so thank you for letting me share that. Yeah. So I, I will make two other points here. One is what happens is that when you're focused on the God within another person, even when you're doing it on your own, but let's take the example of when it is mutual, when both people are saying namaste to each other. What happens is that the differences between you kind of melt away, become irrelevant as compared to the commonality that you have. Because you're, you're basically connecting at the core level. So the differences are very easy to deal with, no matter what they are. So that's point number one. Second is the point of control, the point that you made about connection with stoicism. The deepest connection I see is that then you're acting from the core of you. You are acting from where your maximum control is. And that is the core of your being. And you are just acting from that. And you are not getting bogged down by whatever temporary things the other person has and whatever conflicts that are there, which are all externals. So you are focused on the internal locus of control that you have. And because you're acting from that, it's the same thing as saying, accepting the dichotomy of control. You're saying, I will act from the core of me. That's all I can do, but that's what I can do. And it is very, very powerful. It frees you up. It, otherwise, if you look at the alternative, when you're focused on things you don't control, you are focused on the peripheral. And when you're focused on the peripheral, you lose focus on the center of what you can actually do. So it is another way of formulating the same principle. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Joe. Great, great observations. Next up is Evanique, followed by Connie. Evanique. Yeah, you just said what I was about to say. What I'm getting from the Gita is the um, acceptance of what is in the moment and knowing that the only person you can control is you as a person. You can't control other people. You can't control what you say, what they say and what they do. You can just own it. And I think it's been really helpful in creating a peace, even when things are not going the way I thought they should, or, you know, I mess up somewhere. It's like, okay, what can I do to fix it? What can I do to make it better? And then just leaving it like, and that's the important part too. It's like doing what you can do and then just leaving it alone and just let whatever is going to happen, going to happen. And then take the action that you need and then move on. And, and so that has been very that has been very helpful, and also too. Let, let me do one thing. Can I comment on this point? Yeah. Okay, and then please, you'll be able to keep track of the next point. Yeah, I have it written okay. now. Excellent. Um, so this this very point is the heart of chapter two. This is the concept of sthita pradni. Sthita pradni. So sthita means steady, stationary, standing, 
sth is also you you're kind of you're standing at the core of your being it is all about standing at the core of your being pratnya means wise conscious you know active so it's like you are being wise in a steady way you are conscious in a steady way no matter what is going on so you are kind of standing at the center there is stuff happening in the periphery and you see it okay you you actually see it but it doesn't take your focus away from the core of you it doesn't reach you it doesn't reach the core of you it doesn't bring any darkness to the core your uh, nanishwar talks about having the sun at the center of the being and if there is a sun in the center of your being the darkness just melts away it's not that you are trying to push away the darkness it's just that there there is no space for darkness and that is the concept and it is incredibly powerful because what it does is that it gives you serenity it gives you peace it also gives you tremendous capacity to do things because you're not going to be distracted you're not going to be overwhelmed by anything that is going on you will maintain your presence of mind you will maintain what you should be doing you're focused on the truth you're focused on the goodness all the time so it is about it is a way of being focused on the center and standing in the center and that is the same as being you know is same as acting from your core from your atma and that's the same as being one with the brahma because you are kind of accepting everything you're saying things come to be they live on for some time and die that is part of nature and you are looking at things that way that that is what is going on you accept that as natural part of being and you do not lose this core uh, that is within you go ahead avanik second point yeah so actually that was kind of my second point it wasn't as eloquent but um it's figuring out who you want to be in all situations like who are you going to be at the core are you going to be someone who's shook up at every little thing that happens or are you going to be the person that you picture yourself to be is like this in a sense is it feels like the ultimate like are you going to recognize the god in you at that moment and be the god in you or are you going to let the periphery take control and try to react and try to manipulate and change the situation or you know uh curve it to be whatever you want to be and do what you need to do which i know people like that and they're not happy at all they are not happy with their lives and you can tell because they're trying to control the situation they're just trying to control everything and everybody and they're not focused on inward and on who they are so i i think that is what i've gotten from gita wonderful so i wanted to make one observation about what alison joe and evanik said um i mean what i'm hearing from all all three of you is that this is transformational um because what it is doing is that and it is transformational for several reasons i mean for me this bible was the same kind of a thing dao de jing was same kind of a thing because what it does is that it actually shakes you up from 
the way of thinking that you have been used to. And it lets you reconstitute your ideas afresh. And in the process, I think you let go of a bunch of things. I think it is mostly about letting go of some kind of ways in which you have always thought that have become part of your habitual way of thinking. And then you realize that what you've ended up with is actually core of what you really valued in that whole mess that was there. That, that's how I'm seeing it. I don't know, does this, does this ring true to any of you? Yes, I think that's, you said it perfectly. Joe, what do you think? Yeah, I couldn't unmute there, sorry. Um, yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. I mean, it, it, as I would mentioned in, in previous meetups, I mean, this is like kind of given me uh, a new way of seeing people and the world, and including myself. Uh, and it's identified the work that I need to do. I kind of wish there was some place I could actually go to practice this, like almost for 30 minutes a day or something like that. I know it's more it's a mental. Two hours a day here, Joe. You can come here. Uh, what's that? You probably. Well, well, we, we uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Today, so you that's can true. That, so this is a, no, this is the, this is actually, it, it, in a way, this actually is like going to, uh, you know, a service and finding yourself. And, and, but it has had, I mean, I really do practice it. I mean, in where I'm out and about, I, it, it is something that I absolutely focus on. Um, and, and looking internally has been hard. Uh, and I understand I can't really look, you know, fully look out until I, 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 I look internally, but um, it's been transformative to just, just to continue to frame every interaction and in seeing God in everything. Uh, Wonderful. And everyone, everyone. Wonderful. Alison, what, what do you think? Do you think it, what I was saying rings true? Oh. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I noticed even in the last week, um, I, I mean, I had this conversation with my students. I said, I feel like at the beginning of the pandemic, a lot of people were really, really angry. And then now two years later, it hopefully we're coming out of it. And I feel like people should be happy, but I still see people getting upset over nothing, you know? And I felt like, um, you know, I had, two people who I know um, said some things that, you know, were just like, they were just upset about things that weren't, they didn't need to be upset about. And I know that it's like the stress of all of this. And instead of reacting, I would just could kind of like think about it and think kind of like I was seeing the God in that. I was just, so just overlook what they said, look at the whole person. And then I was able to just not really react to it and just be, um, like supportive and kind when I kind of wanted to go like, you know, but it, it did, it got me to stop and sit there and think about it and think about the, you know, everything and then, and not really react, which is better, you know, cause then it escalates. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I was thinking is the other day I went kayaking and I was thinking that, um, that kayaking is actually like stoicism and like Gita because you have to focus on the internal and it's one thing to look around and see everything but if you start overreacting like there's a bird there's a fish there's another if you're like flailing about paying attention to all these things outside you're going to fall over and you know capsize so as much as you're looking around and observing what's around you you have to just stay calm and stay focused on yourself um in order you know to stay afloat um, yeah, uh, no, excellent point. Um, the point, I want to point out just one thing and then it will be Connie followed by Brian. Um, what happens is that our interactions with other people form like a support system for us, for better or for worse. So what happens is that like when we are what we are, and then we gather, we have this way of interacting with people around us 
that actually supports who we are and who supports what they are. When you change the way you start dealing with people, even ever so slightly, like not getting kind of upset, kind of dealing, you know, trying to understand the core of them, relating to the core of them, which you would not have done otherwise, it actually changes the entire dynamic for them and certainly for you, because you're doing that with so many people that it allows you a way of changing because otherwise the social system, I think has an inertia that will keep you where you are. It will keep supporting what you wear. What this change, when it act, especially when it causes change in the way you interface with other human beings gives you an opportunity of making a fundamental change. Wonderful. Connie, thank you for your patience. Go ahead. Uh, yes. Um, interestingly, um, when I put my explanation point up there, uh, what I was going to say was pretty much what you have just said in the last conversation. Um, studied the Baklavita, uh, I had heard of it before. I had never studied it. I'd read it, but it never made sense. It has been so transformative to me. I literally will not schedule anything for Thursday and Friday nights. I mean, I am like, no, 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 whatever. If the phone rings, I don't answer it. So um, let me just try again. I'm just envious of people express themselves well, but I'm going to, going to struggle through this. Please. The dance that um, I, I think it was, um, I don't know who was Alice. talking about. Alice. Oh, Alice, that's right. Um, I went once, I've always been interested in very basic cultures, you know, like Native Americans. And I went to an event once where they had Native Americans doing in their full dance costumes and they did um, the, their dance. It was life-changing. I was mesmerized. I was in a different place. I mean, and I, I can see that that was their worship. It just came through to me. This was 20 years ago. Um, I... The namaste uh, kept me from this week um, from a reactionary way I would have acted in the future by saying that um, and over in my mind and meditating. I have incorporated it in my meditation, which I've done for many years and I'm in reaching new levels. Now, the one thing that uh, I may say this a little bit wrong, but I know on your chart, on your uh, graphs, whatever, knowledge and then there's meditation, you know, how one gets and we want to go into the four places and forgive me for not being able to say the words. Um, a community was where I really saw I was really at my 5%. And um, so I, this, even though th we don't talk about um, specific religions, you're trying to convert anyone, which is, this is all about studying. So your approach has, I, I just can't tell you, I may start crying, what you've done for me and what this does for me. So I have now, I had stopped going because of the pandemic to church and I moved. I found another church this week and I am a Christian and accepted Jesus Christ as my savior as a child, but I've never been able to grow in my faith. What I've learned in this, or I'm learning, is it is strengthening my faith because it comes from love. And what I have struggled with in my Christianity, because I do come from um, knowledge, that's how I learn. And I think so much, and I, I don't want to offend anyone, but I don't want to come from fear. And this is what I always felt when I was in church is, you know, 
I'm a wretch and, um, you know, come from fear or you'll go to hell. And this doesn't seem to have that bring up, it brings up love and I can come from love. And I've had people trying to get me, for example, in, in Christianity to, if you don't do this, if you don't believe this, you're going to go to hell. That doesn't resonate with me, but it's helping me. You know, I'm going to go back and learn more about the Bible. I love the Bible, and I especially wish we would, in your groups, go back to more books in the Bible. I'm taking a separate Genesis class right now, and uh, C.S. Lewis, I don't know if you've ever studied him, uh, but I do thank you, and um, I've said pretty much the the God within me, I'm really learning, uh, seeing it, and it's affecting my whole life, and I just bless you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Connie. Really appreciate it. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I mean, it is, it is just amazing uh, to hear, uh, you know, what you said. Um, I will, I'll make several points. So firstly, Joe, if you could put the uh, Gospel of John playlist in the chat. Um, we've done, uh, so there, I want to say several things. The first point that you made, one of the points that you made was that you read Bhagavad Gita before, but it didn't, you're not able to get much out of it. And that is actually a very profound point. Um, what we are doing is actually what was done during the scribal age, where there is this writing, but you talk about it. So there are actual people who talk about it, whose character you can see, whose emotions you can see, whose tone of voice, what things mean to them, you can see. So everything that is there on a piece of paper comes alive. And then you write. So there is this loop between writing and then this full-fledged, you're talking about the dance of American Indian. It's the same thing. It's full-fledged expression of your inner life, not just sequentially presented on a piece of paper, but lived. And that is what the power, that's one of the things that we are doing, which is very different from just reading it. So the observation that you've had is, is profoundly, profoundly true. Um, the second point about um, community, I think is huge. Um, in some ways, so we, we're doing several things, I think. Um, I mean, you, you made this point so well. Um, the, the, this community is very different in the way in which it is ap approaching things. There is a profound respect for each individual that everybody has. And every individual is making their own progress in their own way. Nobody is telling somebody, oh, you should be doing that. You should not be doing that. Uh, everybody is progressing in their own way. At the same time, they there is a level of respect that they have for everybody else and everybody else has for them that they feel comfortable expressing things which are very deep for them. And what that does is that that allows you to learn, everybody to learn from each other. If you look at most of the conversation that people have, it is very superficial. It takes for granted almost everything. And you are just talking about very small things. If you are in a group, you are very concerned about making sure that, you know, that the group has certain norms so you would not talk about certain things. So you're kind of doing self-censoring. None of that happens here. And as a result of that, what happens is that I think everybody brings so much to bear. Um, 
specifically on Bible. Uh, thanks, Joe, for putting the uh, playlist. We've done a number of meetups on Gospel of John. Um, Gospel of John is the one that I've started. Uh, I started with. Uh, it's my favorite. Actually, we're doing a meetup this Sunday at 9 p.m. Uh, we're going to have Gary come and talk about Gospel of John and how is it that the Eucharist is not there in Gospel of John and what takes the place of Eucharist in Gospel of John. So it's a really, really fascinating topic. So we're looking at the Bible in great amount of detail and we'll continue to do that. Gary will continue to do the series on that and um, we will, um, you know, we'll look at all these books because they're, they have, the thing that I've noticed is that seeing them side by side in parallel gets you so much more value than seeing one of them because you're coming at the same point from so many, so such fundamentally different context that with each of them, you learn. Let's take the highest of this idea, that of the center. Bhagavad Gita calls it Brahma. Tao Te Ching calls it the Tao. Bible calls it God the Father. So different context. They're trying to talk about the same thing. It is very difficult to talk about. Brian asked me to talk about the center. So I'm talking about the center. This is as best as I can do it. Uh, the you know, Dao De Ching is right. It's difficult to talk about. Naneshwar, when he talks about Brahma, he says, it has to be experienced. You can talk about it. It's like you're calling to it. You're singing to it. Hopefully it hears and you hear back. So you have to have that kind of conversation with it. In Gospel of John, you cannot see the father himself. You see him through the sun and through the words of the sun, through the love of the sun, through show, his showing you how to walk. Um, so it, it is, there are all ways, but when you put all of them together, you get so many different insights. These are all ways of getting to the center. So thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Connie. Really appreciate that. Next up is Brian. Brian, what are you getting from Bhagavad Gita? So the, um, well, very generally, it's just been, for me, it's been amazing. The, um, <clears throat> I've heard the Bible story so often, I guess, I'm kind of used to seeing things in those in that perspective, but seeing it, uh, hearing it from the Bhagavad Gita, was uh, like with beginner's eyes, beginner's mind. It was uh, just amazing. And beyond that, I think that there is a, for me, a tremendous amount of insight, wisdom, uh, love, and the rest expressed in. Uh, Bhagavad Gita those those words don't even capture it but yes there is something about the text itself and the fact that I'm new to it there's a tremendous amount in that text and the fact that I'm new to it I think really makes it rich for me the um, the one thing I wanted to I did have two points one is kind of more of a thinking point that uh, when I was reading today I finally something clicked in my mind that the, the manifest is, is really the twin of consciousness. The manifest is, in our daily lives at least, is the twin of consciousness. If there's no consciousness, there's no manifest. But the, uh, that's kind of a 
that has some implications. But the my real uh, point is uh, that you know, in terms of how it, just a more concrete example of how it's affected me, I find that I'm more patient and uh, less prone to anger. I do have uh, feelings of anger sometimes, but I don't. I wouldn't say I express them a lot anyway, but I don't. I, sometimes when I was aware of them, I would express them. And now I'm aware of them and I don't. And the uh, so that's for me a, a real transformation. And I see beyond that, I guess I see a strength or a benefit in, in that. And that's the thing I wanted to talk about is the strength uh, that I think is coming to me from the Bhagavad Gita. The um, and it, that that occurred to me in listening to this conversation this evening. The um, often when we think about you know, letting go of things beyond our control, uh, it it's a focus on limitation. It's our limitations, accepting our limitations, and. Um, if you don't, then you're you're wandering out into areas of weakness because you're beyond your limitations. I think if you stay uh, within the things that you can control, then that's and that's the kind of the second, the other foot that dropped for me this evening is that then you're in a position of strength, and that's something that I haven't heard uh, emphasized a lot. It's more that uh, a position of that we're aware of the weakness that we when we can't control but i think that if you if you stay within the areas that you can control that's that is a position of strength and doing that is a is a practice and uh, i think one artifact of that one way that it that it expresses itself this strength is through uh, peace of mind internally the uh, i just know that in that type that kind of loops back with the impatience and anger i've seen that in myself and i've seen it in other people but in my neighbors and work everywhere pretty much if people are angry or impatient that to me is a sign that they're they're, they're addressing some issue that's beyond their control so <laughs> it's best uh if, if you're expressing those things, you're you're you are trying to control something you cannot control, mm -hmm. or at least you're not doing it in the right way. And uh, so, to me, the, I guess the big takeaway, or one of the big takeaways from this evening, is that you know, kind of filling in the blank there, that there is strength in within your area if you stay within your area of control, and there, you know that manifests itself too that becomes evident and obvious to people in that it's it can be very attractive uh people kind of people will admire it they'll wonder about it they'll be fascinated with it and then that that strength that you're demonstrating or evidencing becomes a power that gives you an ability to tr to transform other people and that's this namaste, I think, that you were talking about. If you are within your air, within your cell, if you're in, aware of your God, I think I, I guess what I would add to that is then you're in a you're in a place of strength, which I haven't heard said that much. And then uh, that is can be very attractive to other people, and in that way, it it can be transformative for other people. That's what I wanted to say. Wonderful. Brian, that was fantastic. That was fantastic. So let me go ahead and comment on that. Um, so uh, there are two minor points uh, that you made that I want to talk about, and then I want to talk about the major point. The first point you made was about the fact that you're getting a lot from the fact that Bhagavad Gita is new to you. I think that is a very fundamental point, is that when you find something that is talking about the same thing that you're really, really interested in, but it's completely new. It is coming from a different culture. It allows you to do fresh thinking. So that newness is a very large 
point. The second point you made was about the richness of Bhagavad Gita. I do think that Bhagavad Gita as a text is incredibly rich. You know, it is a compilation. It is trying to bring together. It is like, a, like the diamond that is collecting so much of the jewels of the Indian thought within itself and presenting it to you in such a simple, short form. So it is truly rich, incredibly rich. Now, the main point that you made, I think you made it very beautifully. Um, and everybody who has spoken has spoken of these various characteristics, which you all you put together in one place. You know, patience, serenity, acceptance, self-awareness, strength. You know, these are the various ways in which you experience internally what happens when you start to internalize these ideas. The heart of it is what Naneshwar talks about. It is you are going to your Atma. You're going to the core of your being. And you are standing there because you're in love with it. You're experiencing it as blissful. It is not that you're turning away from it. It's just that other things have kind of evaporated in your attention because you're so engrossed in this center of your being. Now, when you are at the center of the being, of your being, it is a point of serenity because that's all there is there. It is a point of acceptance. It is acceptance of yourself, you know, the grandeur of what is in you. It is intense self-awareness. So you are aware of the deepest things that are happening in you. So instead of reacting, you actually see what is going on. And just by being aware of what is going on, you look at things completely differently. And it culminates absolutely in strength because what it is, is that it is you are really standing at the point of maximum leverage within you. That's where you are. And from when you're standing there, there is only leverage, you know, because everything which is small you have stepped away from and you're standing in the biggest place <laughs> that has the maximum power. And it has profound impact on you. And because such a place is there in other people too, the other people see it almost by analogy. They see that in themselves and they see, and they definitely, you see a person who is like that, immediately people will say, wow, what is going on with this person? Like I remember I was in Amritsar, I was staying at this hotel and suddenly all this security shows up. I said, what's going on? It turned out Dalai Lama was there to attend a peace conference. And I saw him just like four feet away. And he had all these security people around him, but he saw a group of children and he dropped everything. He stopped, he kneeled down and smiled with, talk to those kids. And you can see the spirit in the person, this immense gentle strength. It's a gentle strength. It is a strength which is pulling not pushing. It is one that brings people to you. Not one that makes people afraid of you, but one 
that people say, yes, that is beautiful. And it is incredibly powerful. It is the issue of motivation by love versus motivation by fear. Most people think of strength as being able to instill fear in other people. But really fundamental strength is love. I mean, that is what really produces all great things. Um, so that is what it's basically the self-love, the love of your own core is producing something. And that is the strength. It is at once the seat of control, set seat of power, seat of awareness, seat of yours being able to do anything. That's all. So you're just standing there. And that's, it is a point of maximum leverage. So I, I, I think you, you put it beautifully. Thank you. Evanik. Yeah, just really quick. Uh, when Brian was talking about his feelings, I thought about that too. And I think another component to that is not only like, you know, how to express your feelings, but to feel the feelings that you're having. And that's another thing that Ida teaches you is that there's just going to be feelings about certain situations that are there and to just allow it in a sense to just wash over you and you don't have to do anything with it. You don't have to express it if you don't feel like that's the appropriate thing to do. Um, but what you can do with it is you can just let it be and just like be with the emotion and be with the feeling and, you know, not even try to figure it out until you're ready. And then what I've noticed is that when I did that and I didn't try to cover it up or I didn't try to stuff it or I didn't even try to necessarily express it but just to kind of let it be is that it faded eventually like it just fades or you figure out where the feeling's coming from and that's another benefit too just by feeling the feelings is finding out why do I feel this way and then just allowing that to see where you need to maybe make improvements or if there just isn't anything to do with it so that has been free too, is that you're not, and you're not at the mercy of your emotions or feelings, but at the same time, you're not, you're allowing yourself to feel that. And that puts you in a place of control over, not over what you feel, but how you react. Wonderful. Um... I want to elaborate on that. It's, that's a huge point. Um, if you look at the Western world, Western world is generally outwardly focused. And they, we look at most things in terms of, okay, what can you control outside? The Indian mind has spent a lot of time focusing on what is going on in here. And the same approach that Stoics take to externals, the Indian mind takes to the things like emotions and thoughts. It separates and there is, we have just, you know, Gita in Gita, it just begins to talk about this point. This is actually a very fundamental point about the Indian mind. Indian mind is focused on consciousness. In your comment, uh, Evanik, on my diagram, you talked about your attention and what it allows you to do with your attention and what is the result of paying attention versus not, not paying attention. Indian thought holds that attention is the only thing that you have, is the only commodity that you have. It's your core power. It's called concentration or dhyan. Dhyan, your ability to concentrate, ability to pay attention, is not the same as your feelings. It's not the same as your thought, just like it is not 
the same as things outside you. These are all things which are there in the periphery. Things, your body, your emotions, your thoughts are all in the periphery. It is your self-awareness, if it is your, your capacity for awareness, which is the core of your being. And the way it deals with emotions is to say, oh, just like there is a dog walking by, there are these emotions that are going by. It is what it is. See, moment, the, again, it comes back to the point that Joe was making the other day about acceptance. It all starts with acceptance. Just like you have to accept people are what they are, the world is what it is. You have to accept that the emotions are what they are right now, or the thoughts are what they are right now. You can't get attached to them because that's not the core of you. So this idea of learning to direct your attention is the core idea of the Indian thought as I, as I understand it. So fantastic point, right? Does anybody else would like, like to share what they are getting from these Gita discussions? Go ahead and type exclamation mark. Brian, go ahead. So I would like to talk about that uh, I guess it's a thought, or I don't know if it's an insight, but there's a, I'd like to share it and see what people think that the, <clears throat> the, uh, in Bhagavad Gita, we have the unmanifest, which is more, you know, eternal and everywhere. And then we have the different manifestations of the unmanifest. And that, and that's really been quite an insight for me and a, uh, I, you know, I could talk a while just about that point, but the, um, it occurred to me today that uh, consciousness is the flip side of any kind of manifestation, that if something's going to be manifest, it's manifest to some other thing, to someone or something, and that uh, the, the act of manifestation is, it's the consciousness that's capable of receiving that manifestation. The, um, and then I had several thoughts that spun off off of that was the, uh, number one, that you know, all things have some consciousness, I think, like rocks and flowers, and rocks, flowers turn toward the sun, and, and so they are conscious of the, in some, they are aware of the heat and the light. I think they're aware of gravity. They grow up, they don't grow down and uh, they seek out water. So there's a lot of consciousness going on in flowers and they express it in a certain way, just by the way they grow. And we have consciousness that expresses itself. In other ways, rocks are conscious of uh, temperature they can crack if, if it's too hot. Uh, so they have a consciousness that gets expressed in certain ways, an awareness of heat that expresses itself in certain ways. The, um, and then you, I just kind of stepped back from that and thought, well, you know, our consciousness, I guess, is more acute than a rock or a flower. But just like a rock or a flower, our consciousness is not perfect. And so just like a rock or a flower, there's so many things that we do not perceive and our, and our consciousness does not, you know, it, it expresses itself in a certain way, but it's not a perfect or complete way. It's just the human way. The, um, and then the other thing uh, that occurred to me is that all of these, con all of this consciousness is possible because you are a part of the whole and the kind of consciousness that we have 
that we, you know, that we live every day is the consciousness of being a part. Not, and, and the consciousness I think that Bhagavad Gita is pointing at is a consciousness of being the whole. And I'm not really in touch with that yet, but that's, uh, to me, I feel like it's something like that. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, folks, does anybody want to talk about what they are getting from anybody else who wants to talk about what they're getting from Bhagavad Gita? Go ahead and type a uh, exclamation mark if you'd like to share. Even if it's a short comment, you're welcome to make a comment. Joe, go ahead. Um, I think uh, it's worth mentioning like Yogeshwar's commentary. Yes, is please. one of those things, you know, that is actually uh, really has kind of given me a, a whole new, uh, uh, you know, insights or a whole new set of insights into reading the Gita because I'm reading it. And the, even though there's, there's some descriptions of it, but he brings another level to it. Um, every time I read what, what, you know, any commentary, where it be Sri Aurobindo, um, or I don't read none as sure as much, uh, but um, I start to actually, when he gets up and he's speaking today, like what we were talking about, I won't say the word right. Vishwarup uh, Darshan. I'll get that right. I will. I'll get that right by this weekend. I promise. I really. <laughs> um, and, but picking up on things like that, um, that, that, that actually, then puts other things into context, mm -hmm. uh, like and and it starts to put the whole story into context, because then you start to understand this, the the idea. Okay, sight and the senses and how the senses were overwhelmed, and then how he's actually now seeing God and everything, and he's and he's seeing into a different world. And I would not I would not have gotten that without Yogeshwar, um, without, a, without a doubt. Um, so I think he's, and he does it, um, and, and also it's worth noting the way he handles the Q&A um, is masterful, it really is. Um, some of those questions that we have are, it, it's, you know, these are cross-cultural questions and uh, he takes them and he, really explains them clearly i mean and that's not an easy thing to do um where where uh, he knows what we want to get at but even if we're not expressing ourselves clearly um and and to do that across cultures and so it, it, it and so it shouldn't be understated that you know yes this is w whether you know be um not so much to tell, but I'm, I'm guessing, I'm guessing it might be with Confucius, it might be a little bit more difficult to digest. But um, uh, whenever you have these cross-cultural dialogues, it, it's, a, it's a challenge. It's a challenge and um, he's really, really been fantastic. So I thought that that was worth noting in and of itself because he's brought it to another level for me. And, um, and I think by the end of this, I'll have, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be, I don't want to stay where I'm going to be, but, but it's, I'll have a much better, I'll be in a much better place than I was um, prior to, to uh, uh, you know, obviously prior to reading the Gita, but even more so because of that. Thank you. So folks, uh, I'm, I would. I really would like to know what you're getting from Yogeshwar's commentary. Uh, so please go ahead and type exclamation mark if you'd like to share what you've learned. Because there was a time that we we started these meetups. You know, Yogeshwar discovered us, and then I invited him to go and share, um, which he was, you know, generous enough to do. 
Uh, he's also attended several of the meetups in the Bible and Tao Te Ching. So he's really, he likes what we do in all our meetups. But I think he has brought a lot to the, the Gita meetups. And I think the Gita meetups are many times better because he is, you know, he's adding so much. So if you have any comments about what you are getting from it, uh, you're welcome to share. Um, so I've, I'll tell you while, while people are lining up, I'm going to go ahead and tell you that my parents are so delighted with the commentary because they actually had not read Bhagavad Gita before me. So it was me who kind of convinced them to read Gita. Then they started reading Naneshwari and they really got into it. And they've been going, you know, going through it. But especially at chapter 10, because they were focused on reading, going through their Naneshwari. And Naneshwari is fantastic. And they can read Marathi. So they were able, they are able to read the original in, you know, listen. There is a like a version uh, in Marathi that they listen to. So they were getting a lot. And up, up, they came up to chapter 10 and they listened to one of the things that Yogeshwar did on chapter 10. By the way, Yogeshwar's, what he did with chapter 10 completely blew me away. Completely blew me away because I did not get that from chapter 10. When I read it several times, I listened to it several times, I read Nanishwar's commentary on it, I did not get that he was able to really take that chapter and show the entire cultural context uh, on it. But um, I want to have other people comment first. Um, Evany, what are you getting from Yogeshwar's comment? I get uh, a more practical sense of how to apply to get it to life. And I think it's because of the examples that uh, Yogeshwar uses. Um, also, the way he's able to interpret the uh, Naneshwar commentary, I think it's been great. And I think the way you and um, you and Yageshwar work with each other, the way you guys work together, it makes it more fulfilling and it just makes it a more uh, practical experience. And it, like I said, you can apply it to all areas of your life. So when you both explain it as well, like you, when you guys work together in partnership, it becomes even uh, it becomes an even better meetup. So it's it, it, he's been great, and like you say, the way he can field questions and you know from different from a different culture, complete from his and you as well, um, I think, and just like make it in a way that we can understand. It, it's just it has brought so much. Uh, it says for for me anyway so much of a deeper understanding. Thank you, uh, Joe. Can I ask you for a favor? Uh, can you put the link to the Bhagavad Gita uh, YouTube playlist for Daniel? Thank you. Um, absolutely. So one of the things that you you mentioned, Evanik, was about the practical examples that he gives. See, he actually lives this thing. Okay, like he, so he's able to understand it really, really well. Um, and so the examples that he gives are so down to earth and he will say, okay, you know what this, is? so I, I really love his, his examples and they add, uh, and only a person who actually understands something can give you a simple example that can bring out a deep principle very simply to you. Um, Connie, followed by Preeti. Connie, what are you getting from your gracious comment? He is, not only does he, what he says, but his face, when I look at him, and frankly, you, the joy and the um, genuineness and the truth just add such a level um, beyond. Um, he's, yes, that's. Thank you. Thank you, Connie. Really appreciate that. Preeti. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say, I really, yeah, I really love um, Yugeshwar's sort of 
breakdown, the way he breaks it down. I've tried in the past to read the Gita on my own and it always felt too complicated or like, oh gosh, I don't, I don't get it and I'd give up. So it's nice to have someone break it down kind of line by line. So I really feel like I understand it. I also really love the Sanskrit, just hearing it. And, you know, Gita is so much about, you know, the sounds and like the vibrations of the sounds, like how that has an effect on you in a way that maybe we don't even understand. So I really think that's like a really nice part of it, a valuable part of it. And another sort of practical example that I wanted to share was, um, I can't remember if it was last time or the time before he mentioned not just seeing a tree, but kind of sensing the presence of a tree. Mm-hmm. And today I was on a walk and I, that I passed a tree and I thought of that. And I really was able to kind of make that shift from just passing a tree to being like, okay, this is, this is a living being with a presence and just cho- choosing to see that. And it, the experience changed. I actually felt that difference. I felt that shift of like, it went from being like a flat experience of, oh, this is a tree to sensing the presence of a living being. And I thought of the words or the example that your said. And so that was really nice. It was like a practical way to bring what we've learned here into my life. So I'm really thankful for that. Thank you. Thank you, Priti. Uh, next up is going to be Marco followed by Brian. Marco. Um, no, just a really quick, like from one of the early, like, uh, talks, um, the early chapter is like, um, sort of like when, you know, knowing that we are the, the way, the, the ocean and not the ways, um, that's something that Yogeshwar said that I still like repeat to myself pretty much like every day. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Uh, next up is Brian. Brian, go ahead. So I agree with, uh, I think Connie said, both you and Yogeshwar are just extraordinary in, in exactly the way she said. The, um, and I've said before, you know, the two words that come to mind when I'm able to part, when I think about my participation here is a great privilege and great good fortune. I just um, uh, so, so happy. And uh, what uh, Joe said, the ability to uh, explain these things cross-culturally, I think is really unique and extremely important. And in, in that regard, I will say, uh, Srikant, I did say once in a, maybe a couple months ago, or maybe three months ago, that what you're doing is historic. And you took it as historical that we're looking back and seeing things in their context. I see it as historic in that what you're doing now will have tremendous impact on the future. Thank you, thank you, Brian. Thank you. I, you know, uh, we, uh, I, I, you know, I, we, we are trying and I think, I think we're, we're doing well. I think we're doing well. I think um, I am amazed of how well things are coming together, how much learning that I am doing and what each of us is doing. You will notice that Yogeshwar's capability of explaining Gita is going up meetup by meetup. If you look at his earlier videos and today, you can see the levels in his his ability to actually speak to any audience is going up. So individually, each of us are growing. And this work, what we're doing is essentially trying to capture something that was there in the scribal age. In some ways, it's a retrieval. You know, this is how people talked about things in the Gurukuls of India. This is how people talked about in the peripatetic school of Aristotle, in the University of Paris of Aquinas, in the Zen masters, you know, in Japan with Lao Tzu and his students. This kind of mode of talking 
And then, you know, th thanks to the great age that we are living in, technological age, we are able to look at these, all of these together. And then we have this amazing group of people, including you, Joe, Evany, all of us who are here. And everybody is so open-hearted about sharing what we know and how we feel at the deepest level. And I think each of us is learning from it. So it is, it is absolutely, and I, I agree with you that I think this is a good fortune. I feel the same way. I'm enormously grateful. And I think it's a good fortune. It's tremendous fortune to have this community. So I really, really appreciate that. Thank you. Next up is Joe. Yeah, I think it is. It, it, well, it, it's it's transformative as well um, on multiple levels, and I, and I and I talked about that. Uh, but you know, I've been thinking a lot about your hex, hexagon, your your radiant hex, uh, hexagon, and um, and just seeing that. And I really believe reading these three works, I can appreciate that 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 diagram uh, far more than mm -hmm. I would be able to if I had just looked at it and dissected it from a, you know, kind of intellectual point of view. I, I see something much deeper mm -hmm. and it's, you see the spirit in, in the diagram mm -hmm. and it's, and you, you start to see those relationships within that. Uh, even the, the, you could start to slice it between the cardinal virtues and the and the and the essentially love devotion and and then uh beauty mm -hmm. you could see the distinctions between those and they can but you can also see the connections mm -hmm. and if you see that i i can only see that by studying these three texts mm -hmm. and um so it's a different way of looking at the world and if i can get the process down i know it's not a process but if i can get the I don't know what the right, right word is. If I can get, if I, if I can, if I, if I can get my mind to adapt uh, fast enough, um, then this, this is also this is transformative in a number of different ways. Absolutely. Way. Look, Absolutely. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I like, I mean, I agree with you. Um, I think the diagram is huge because it actually allows us to bring all of these things together and talk about everything in the one diagram. And I think that is going to do magic on the top of everything that, that Brian is talking about. So I think, I think that's very significant. I'm very, very excited about that. Um, you know, I think I have something which has legs and this is quite powerful. So I'm looking forward to kind of building it out. Um, but I want to talk more about Yogeshwar. Um, but uh, Ginny, go ahead. I have been a minor participant and um, I am fairly new to this group, but I do want to say to you, Shrikant, what a wonderful gift that you have been giving to the community at large. And um, every day of the week, the way you have these meetings, I, I do want to thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ginny. Appreciate that. Okay, so now let me tell you about Yogeshwar uh, as I see it. Uh, so there are several things. So firstly, Yogeshwar did this piece on Gayatri Mantra. Now Gayatri Mantra, for those people who are used to, who are from India, that is something that everybody actually knows. Like 90% of American, uh, Indians will know that. But they do not understand it. And what he's doing, he's actually doing is not only explaining this Gita to a different audience, but actually Indians, like my parents were completely blown away by it. They forwarded it to everybody that they knew. And they, they too were blown away by that. So he's genuinely bringing the original meaning of things and making it accessible to anybody who wants it. 
regardless of whether they are Indians or they are, you know, in, in the West. Um, secondly, uh, I love the Sanskrit. I have, I have a special thing, you know, I, I studied Sanskrit as a kid and I can read about 90% of the words and it's such a beautiful language and each root, I know the roots. So to see how like sthita pradnya, so the fact that it is saying stay, it's the same root as stay, the same root as place, same root as stand. It is a question of, you know, steady, the same root of steady. So all of the, all of the meanings of the roots are, you know, just even when I read it, I get some of it, but when he's explaining it, I get a lot more. So for me, the reconnecting deeply with the Sanskrit language is a huge thing. Secondly, his entire approach is actually very unique that you will not find in most people in India who study this, that he's genuinely open, he has a genuinely open mind to understanding other things. You know, he's been attending Tao Te Ching, he's been attending Bible and he loves it. And he's able to explain things in terms of the other and talk about Bhagavad Gita in context of the other. That is a mind which is genuinely open, trying to understand and not focused on just one tradition or one way of approaching one tradition in a ritualistic way. So that is another, that's another point. Secondly, his learning is amazing. You know, he has not only read Bhagavad Gita in Sanskrit, but he has read all the major commentaries in Sanskrit. Not only he has read them, but he's actually gone and stayed with the people for months who are practicing based on that commentary. So he has this embodied grasp of multiple traditions of interpreting Gita. In spite of the learning, he actually relates to human beings as human beings, as all of us should, and all of us do. And that is great because that's the only way you can actually communicate with people. You can see the God in the other person. That is the only way you can actually communicate with other people. Um, but again, it is rare for person of learning to realize that all of us are seekers and all of us are trying to learn. And that quality in us of being a seeker, being, you know, wanting to learn is the only thing that matters. Not what we, not the knowledge we have achieved, but what what new thing are you going to learn today? It is a living experience. We, the Brahma is much larger than what we know and you have to be continuously open to that. So he has that throughout. I am really impressed by how much he has grown and he keeps growing. He is very comfortable and he's able to communicate things very clearly, these are actually very difficult things to communicate. You're trying to communicate a heritage of a very large culture, heritage that it has developed over centuries to a culture which is not that culture. And he's able to do that. I also think that our you know, my interaction with him works very well because I'm continuously on the lookout for saying, what is it that the American audience, you know, these friends of mine, or all of you who are here, what is it, what kind of questions might come to your mind when something is being said? What may be difficult? What kind of connections would make it make it more real to you. 
how will it connect? How, how can I connect it to some knowledge that you already have? And I provide that piece, which actually makes whatever he's saying far more effective. Um, so I think the partnership works very well. Um, he's very much open to feedback, which is fantastic. You know, I keep, you know, if I notice something, you know, he says, oh, Shrikant, you want to say something? Even if I begin to think that, of, that I want to say something, he notices that. So he's, he's very responsive. So, so it's just wonderful having him here. Um, I think I want to also um, say that what Jason is doing for us, for the Chinese culture is of tremendous value to all of us, what he's done with Tao Te Ching, what he's about to start with Confucian uh, Analects is of tremendous value to us. It is providing us with another large context. And it's a way of triangulating more things we have to triangulate, the deeper our understanding is going to get. I think um, we are beginning to do, I think we're doing very well on the Bible meetups, you know, thanks to Aquinas, uh, who's not here, he doesn't come here, unfortunately, but uh, he, what he has contributed, and um, Gary is starting out by doing some meetups. And Gary is also a very impressive person. Uh, he's been studying, you know, he's been doing masters on theology. He's focusing on the chapter 13 of Gospel of John. His entire, he has done a lot of coursework and worked with lots of professors who are students of the Gospel of John who have specialized on Gospel of John. So I am expecting that we will get a lot more from that. Um, so I think, I think we are on a good, you know, very good trajectory here. And I, I think I agree with Brian that we are doing something historic. Um, and I look forward to leveraging it. And um, I have to tell you that I'm not particularly good at doing this uh, in terms of kind of leveraging it. You know, in my diagram, my weakest point is the prudence point of kind of converting this into something that will transform the world. I can do that in a small group of friends like you are in a good community, I can do that. I don't know that I'm particularly good at doing it on a large scale. So if you guys have any ideas at any point, I would have greatly appreciate that. Um, I think the biggest thing that we have going is that that diagram, because that allows us to actually bring everything together to make this scribal mode. I think the insight that Mark Stallman has, that scribal, is retrieved by the digital is, is fundamental. And I don't know of anybody who has retrieved scribal as well and in as diverse a way as we have been doing. There are people who have gone in depth, but in terms of breadth and trying to make connections, I don't think there is too much going on in the world like this. So this genuinely has legs. And I look forward to any ideas that anybody has on what we can do with it. I think the diagram brings things together and we would be able to kind of, another way of saying that seeing the diagram is that that hexagon is essentially the scribal. Everything inside there is the scribal virtue. The, illuminated by the center. It is the Tao, it is the Brahma, and it is, it is God the Father at the same time. The inside, the, the radiant thing is all of 
living existence. It's what, what it looks like when form follows function. Most of the stuff outside, most of the modern conversation is proceeding outside. When Nietzsche says God is dead, he's saying that there is no operating center right now for society. And I think we are doing something special. So I, uh, Brian, I actually agree with you, but I don't know what to make of it. That's, that's where I am. Um, Joe. So this may be way off. So just sure. take it Go for ahead. what it's worth. Um, but, you know, you kind of can see certain aspects of the tetrad in this diagram and things okay. that are being retrieved. Like you're retrieving something much deeper than you're retrieving yourself okay. in that in this diagram. And you, I, I, I think that that's, I don't know, there's something to that and, and I'm looking at it. Maybe it just, I'm looking at the shapes and seeing things, I don't, I don't know. Um, sure, I look forward talk to about exploring it. that with you. Yeah, we could talk about it. Yeah, sounds good. All right, folks, um, thank you so much. It's, it's always a pleasure and just, just so, so amazing to spend this time with you. See you tomorrow. We'll continue tomorrow with starting with verse 21. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you again. Bye.